Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Beyond the Right Thing to Do, the Legal Case for Class Implementation. Before I move forward, I just want to make sure that everyone's audio is working appropriately. If you can hear me, please raise your hand. There should be a little hand icon. Before we begin, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping rules. If you do experience any technical difficulties during, to, during today's webinar, please feel free to contact GoToMeetings Corporate Account Customer Support, and you might want to jot down the numbers listed here, just in case. Also, today's webinar is being recorded, and both the webinar recording and the presentation slides will be posted to our center's website with a webinar recording available out on our center's YouTube channel. That will be sent within 24 hours of today's webinar. During the Q&A session, I take questions that were submitted in advance of the webinar. I take questions that are typed in during the webinar. And also, if you have activated your audio controls, meaning you dialed in via the phone, you'll need to enter the audio pin. I can also take questions verbally. With that, if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, just feel free to go ahead and type your question, and I'll just be taking those as they come in. So let me tell you a little bit about our center. The Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions was founded in 2002 by Dr. Thomas Lavis, our center director. We are funded by the National Institutes of Health, the National Institutes on Minority Health and Health Disparities. In 2006, our center was designated a National Center of Excellence in Health Disparities Research. In these very challenging economic times, we are very proud of the fact that in fall 2012, our center received its third five-year grant cycle of funding. We are also very proud of our center director, Dr. Lavise, who was inducted into the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences in late October. Congratulations, Dr. Lavise. And without further ado, I will turn our presentation over to today's presenter, Bruce Adelson. Thank you. And thank you, Cherie, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for attending our webinar today, Beyond the Right Thing to Do, the Legal Case for Class Implementation. Uh, I have a, a lot of material I want to cover today. Uh, there will certainly be time for questions at the end. So let's get started. Next, please. Uh, I am a former senior attorney for the United States Department of Justice, and I am currently CEO of Federal Compliance Consulting, LLC, which is in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, we are nationally recognized for our compliance expertise, training, and other assistance we provide to organizations to figure out the complexities of federal law. One of my responsibilities during my federal law enforcement career was having national enforcement responsibility for Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That is the federal law that will be the focus of at least a big part of the legal discussion today, the legal case for class implementation. Next slide, please. I've always been of the view, and I've certainly learned this in many ways, that in, uh, in difficult ways during my DOJ career, that good intentions and doing the right thing are often not enough. That's in large part why we have the laws that we're going to talk about. And I think when you look at good intentions, good intentions did not end slavery in the United States. They did not end legal segregation. That's why by the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and a whole host of other fe uh, federal civil rights legislation and court decisions came about. As one of the, my colleagues from my justice career reminded me when I began at Justice uh, more than 10 years ago, these laws are there to protect us from our other selves. So. Uh, my view is what the legal one, the enforcement one, and I think that's a very important view to have when we're looking at the class standards and class implementation. Next slide, please. 
So the key points that we'll talk about, I'm going to introduce you to Title VI today. We're going to learn about the basics, how the law may apply to you. Then we'll talk about cultural competence, class, and federal law. Well, I'm sorry, could, could you, oh, thank you. Liability, which as an attorney is one of my favorite topics, and the current state of enforcement and litigation, just to kind of give you a sense of where things stand as far as federal enforcement and also what's happening in the private litigation uh, arena, which in many respects I think is very revealing of trends and where we're going nationally as far as um, the, the legal system and the laws that we're going to be talking about. Next slide, please. The next two slides are some terminology that, that I may be referring to today, and it's terminology that's very important when you're focusing on the language assistance portions of Title VI and the language assistance portions of the class standard. So let's go through them quickly, and I, and I certainly advise if you could read them. Uh, along with me because I won't be reading them verbatim. Bilingual refers to being able to understand and communicate fluently in two languages. Interpretation is essentially the act of listening oral. It, it, it's, a, it's an oral medium. Converting information from one language to another orally. Translation is the written version of interpretation in a sense. And as the slide says, rendering written text from one language into an equivalent written text in another language. So interpretation and translation are inextricably connected as far as language assistance, but they are in a way parallel tracks when you're looking at language assistance. Vital document is basically any paper or hard copy electronic written material that is important for limited English proficient people to be able to access federally conducted, federally subsidized programs or activities. So please remember, vital documents a very important component of Title VI. That's also an important component of class. Next slide, please. LEP. The term LEP, or limited English proficient, or proficiency, originated with the U.S. Census Bureau. So it's a federal term of art, in a sense. LEP means someone whose primary spoken language is not English, that person has a limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English, or basically move through a, an organization meaningfully with, uh, with uh, an ability to access the programs that the organization uh, fosters. So LEP people may be competent in certain types of communication, but they still have difficulty um, communicating in English and understanding English. Language assistance services are basically interpretation, translation, and almost anything that you can think of that will assist someone who's LEP, limited English proficient, in moving through, navigating through a federally subsidized organization. Next slide, please. As we all know, there's been a lot of change in the United States demographically. And all you have to do, which is what I do uh, sometimes during my leisure, is thumb through census data, particularly American community survey data, to see just how the country has changed as far as race, for example, and language. If you look at uh, maps of the United States today compared to 10, 20 years ago, even five years ago, there have been significant changes. That many of those changes impact class, health disparities, diversity, and have a direct connection to the legal requirements of Title VI. Next slide, please. And Title VI. On the surface, Title VI, at least this paragraph, which is the heart of Title VI, seems pretty basic. No person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So let's talk about the key phrases here. No person in the United States, this statute has is not a citizenship or status-based statute. It concerns any living person in the United States. So if you are alive and you're in the United States, 
this law applies to you. Race, color, national origin are the types of discrimination prohibited by this law, just those three. This is not a disability related statute, for example, or a statute that has anything to do with discrimination based on religion or sexual orientation. Race, color, national origin, that's it. And then in many ways the most important is the last phrase. Under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So this only applies to organizations that receive federal assistance, federal subsidies, Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement, for example, from the federal government. If you do not receive federal financial assistance, then Title VI simply does not apply to you. There are, of course, other federal civil rights laws that we're really not going to be talking about today that may implicate behavior within your organization. But as far as Title VI, if you don't receive federal subsidies, then thank you very much for coming, but a lot of what we're talking about won't necessarily apply to you. But I suspect that the vast majority, if not all of you, are recipients of federal funding. Next slide, please. Title VI is a historic law. It's part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is one of the most historic civil rights laws in American history. The picture on the left shows President Lyndon Johnson in July 1964 signing this statute into law. Part of the reason that this is so historic is that Title VI, being part of the larger Civil Rights Act of 1964, had a leading role in ending legal segregation in the United States. The law was introduced in Congress by President Kennedy in the fall of 1963, several weeks before he died. The law was inspired by the deaths, of, deaths and, and injuries to several African American children during the church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. Next slide, please. So as these quotes indicate, this is, a, this is a big deal. This is definitely a historic law uh, for many, many reasons. And as I um, tell people all the time, uh, this, is, this, is, this Title VI in many ways is at the core of many other parts of the larger Civil Rights Act, which has many other components. Employment discrimination, there are parts of the Civil Rights Act of 64 that deal with voting for example, but Title VI, which is the, our focus today, has a significant, has had a significant impact uh, in the 49 years since its introduction, since its passage and enactment into law. Next slide, please. So these are some of the basics of Title VI. So no discrimination in federally subsidized programs, no discrimination, race, color, national origin. Now, the national origin discrimination prong is, in many ways, what we'll focus on today. National origin discrimination, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, other federal courts, and the United States Department of Justice, is language-based discrimination. So what that effectively means is Title VI requires federally subsidized organizations to open their uh, programs to give meaningful access to their programs to people who essentially don't speak English gives them an affirmative obligation to provide language assistance. The failure to provide language assistance, either at all or effectively, can be a violation of Title VI and can constitute national origin discrimination. Title VI applies no matter how much federal money you're getting. If you get a dollar or a billion dollars or a trillion dollars, Title VI applies to you. There are questions about how, how it applies and how you go about your compliance, but once you receive federal funding, I always like to analogize this as to throwing a pebble in a pond and the ripples touch all the banks, so the pebble representing federal funding is thrown into your pond. Those ripples touch all corners of your organization. Title VI applies to every part of a hospital, for example. That's receives federal financial assistance. It's not just the radiology department or the emergency department or the MRI suite. It's everything. Once you get federal funding in an organization, 
everybody's covered. You can't separate out individual departments, individual offices. Once you get it, remember that analogy, the ripples touch all corners of the organization. Next slide, please. These examples are what lawyers like to, like to call well-settled law. Title VI is well-settled law. This is not something that is currently being heavily litigated where there are some questions about well, what does it mean and what is the Justice Department, what, what are their guidelines, what do they have to say. The middle quotation from a federal court decision almost a year ago in Arizona says it, says it quite well. Long-standing federal case law, federal regulations, and agency interpretation of those regulations hold language-based discrimination constitutes a form of national origin discrimination under Title VI. So I, I'm asked all the time, well, where does it say that? Why does, where does it say we have to do what you're saying we have to do? And my response to that is just to show this slide, and uh, that usually takes care of the question. Next slide, please. So Title VI really applies, it has very broad application. Hospitals, state agencies, city departments, county departments, public schools, nonprofits, and many other types of organizations. Show me a hospital that receives not one penny of federal funding, not one penny of federal financial assistance, and I'll just fall down right now. I have, didn't see that in my career as a federal law enforcement officer, and I don't see that now. In, the, in our practice. So they may exist. If you're out there, please feel free to email me um, because I always like to learn. I like to learn every day and be surprised. So as I said, the Title VI coverage is vast. That when you're talking about uh, government agencies, that's also going to apply to, for example, police departments, emergency management, fire departments, courts, uh, transit agencies, airports, Think Title VI when you're flying around the country because virtually every airport in the United States that, that has, if not every airport, that has commercial air traffic is federally funded and Title VI applies to them. So just think about that the next time you're in an airport or the next time you take the subway or a light rail or a bus because all those agencies are covered too. Next slide, please. Title VI requires what's called meaningful access to federally subsidized service, services. So what does that mean? Of course, as we've discussed, the language assistance to people who are LEP, trained certified interpreters, bilingual staff, and volunteers. By using the term certified here, certified refers to assessed. You are required to provide an assessment of of people's language ability. If they're going to be translating for you, interpreting for you, providing directions to LEP people at your information desk, then you have to determine that they're able to do that. Now, I speak three languages other than English, but until, if I were working for any of you, until you determine what my language abilities allow me to do, do they allow me to give directions, explain informed consent, for example? then I really can't be providing language assistance for you. That's federally required language assistance. Translated vital documents. Remember, we talked about that briefly at the beginning. Vital documents are your most important written materials. They need to be there, required to be translated. In a healthcare setting, that will refer, for example, to informed consent forms. And one of my favorite examples are discharge instructions. When HHS, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, came out with their Title VI guidance about 10 years ago, their guidance did not include discharge instructions as a vital document. And at the time, I disagreed with that. That was when I, I was still at the Department of Justice. Earlier this year, in one of the many documents, advisories, opinions that HHS puts out, they, they issued something that indicated that, lo and behold, discharge instructions are considered vital documents. So that's just part of the complexity of this. As you'll see as we move forward today, this is very complex with myriad connections to court decisions, guidances, regulations. Um, not surprisingly, 
this also the information that we're going to talk about is not something that my legal colleagues generally know. I didn't learn about this in law school. I learned about this when I was trained by the Attorney General of the United States to understand what law I would be enforcing. So a lot of what we're talking about is far from common knowledge, even though the legal requirements likely apply to virtually all of you. The last point is one of my favorites. Children, friends, parents, relatives should not, should not be providing language assistance in your facilities, particularly in hospitals or with other health care providers. That was always a major red flag when I worked with justice. That was a key part of the medical malpractice case that I was involved in three years ago, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. Do not use children, friends, parents, relatives to provide language assistance. Virtually the only exception is in an emergency. Next slide, please. So how do you provide language assistance? Now, this slide is not intended for you to decide which ones you like and which ones you don't, and pick two of them and disregard the rest. As the, the line says at the bottom of the slide, it's everything. Compliance is everything. Compliance is redundancy upon redundancy. And compliance also is not you deciding what works for you. Remember, the law covers certain populations and protects them from discrimination and requires you to provide meaningful access to them. It's, this is not a question of your convenience. This is not a question of what works for you. This is the law is about what you are required to provide to people so they can get meaningful access. So if, for example, uh, using video remote interpreting is, is not going to work in all corners of your hospital. So that cannot be legally the only method you use to provide Title VI required language assistance. If you do, you're going to have a compliance problem. I guarantee it. Next slide, please. Class, the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services in Healthcare. As you know, they provide a, a, an overall framework for how to serve uh, people of uh, various races, colors, and languages, designed to minimize, eliminate, alleviate healthcare disparities based on race, for example, language, minority group status, disability. Next slide, please. What a lot of people don't realize is the class isn't just about a collection of feel-good guidelines. CLASS has an unbreakable connection to Title VI and to federal law. So we're, what we're really going to focus on today is what that connection is all about and where it comes from. How does it affect your organizations and what you need to be aware of? Because ignoring CLASS, you ignore CLASS to your detriment, you ignore CLASS to your peril, both financially and as far as uh, professional licensure. Class is a big deal, legally, because it informs so much of the legal requirements of Title VI and can go a long way with implementation to ensuring you are lowering your, lowering your risk of liability, lowering your hospital readmissions, and putting yourself in the best possible compliance posture. Next slide, please. The next two slides are quotations from A Failure to Communicate, Caring for Patients with Limited English Proficiency by my good friend, Dr. Bob Like. Uh, Bob and I are made an, uh, a media connection when we were the co-keynote speakers at a presentation in New Hampshire a few years ago in many respects because we're both from the Bronx. So we get to talk Bronx, talk about the Yankees, and talk about a lot of good, other good New York stuff. So take a few seconds, just read this paragraph, please, with particular attention to the red highlight in the, la in the last clause. Please remember the last clause, disparities in health outcomes and in health care itself. And as we're going through the slides, please recall the phrase and also think about disparities. In the Title VI context, disparities based on race, on color, 
on language. Think about them because that connects you with this clause, with class, and with the legal underpinnings of class. Next slide, please. Okay, please read this and also with particular attention to the highlights in red. The first one's very important, and that's in, in many ways certainly what we're all about in the work that we do, and, and certainly in my experience with justice. Patient safety risk management concerns related to caring for people who are LEP. Risk management equals liability. Risk management means getting sued. Risk management means getting investigated by the federal government. So, as I said, cultural competency class, much more than doing the right thing. It has a direct connection to risk management and your financial bottom lines. The last clause, potential impact of pay for performance and other reimbursement strategies on disparities, there's that word again, in health and health care. Today, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, we'll talk a little bit about this later on, uh, there are significant penalties for uh, ex uh, high readmission rates, for treating people. You don't get paid for treating people who are readmitted to your hospital for problems that should have been taken care of the first time. In fact, I was just reading a study just the other day, a new study that uh, relates lower readmissions to providing patient-centered information, better information to patients. In the Title VI in class context, that is absolutely going to include language, language assistance, compliant language assistance, effective language assistance to people who are LEP. Next slide, please. So looking at class, tracking the law. This slide, you see, this is class standard number four. Educate and train governance, leadership, and workforce in culturally and linguistically appropriate policies and practices on an ongoing basis. This is one of the standards that is directly connected to Title VI. Title VI requires that federally subsidized organizations have mandatory training to train staff. That's just not employees, that's contractors and non-employed physicians, for example, on the requirements of Title VI. The requirements are a lot more than a five-minute conversation in a, um, a new employee orientation, for example. The effect of Title VI training is going to sound, frankly, a lot like what we're talking about today. Next slide, please. These four standards, let's take a minute and please read them over, are the five standards, class standards, five, six, seven, and eight. I'll, I'll take a minute, I'll wait a minute while you read through them and then we'll discuss them momentarily. Next slide, please. As you can see, this is courtesy of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health. Class standards 4, 5, 6, and 7 are based on Title VI. They weren't just like made up out of whole cloth. They come from Title VI. They come from the statute, regulatory guidance, regula regulations, advisories, and the myriad information that comes out from the federal government. So if you, if you recall what, what the theme of this part of our presentation, looking at class tracking the law, you know, I know that there are always a lot of questions from health care providers, where does this stuff come from and why should we care about it? And again, my focus is not on the subjective doing the right thing and on good intentions, it's on the law. That's, that's my job as an attorney. That was certainly my job as a law enforcement officer, looking at the legal underpinnings, aspects, and connections to class and what we're focusing on today. So those standards, violate those standards, 
you're on the fast track to having a Title VI compliance problem and potentially a significant medical malpractice problem, which we'll also talk about in a few moments. Could you go back to the previous slide, please? Look at number eight. Provide easy to understand print and multimedia materials and signage in languages commonly used by populations in the service area. Sounds like that's connected to vital documents, don't you think? Vital documents, as we discussed, is a required component of Title VI compliance. So to me, four, five, six, seven, and eight derive from Title VI. Not just derive from it, they're directly related to it and inform your organization's overall Title VI compliance. Next slide, please. And we'll go to the next one, please. These are the class standards 12, 13, 14, and 15. So let's take a moment, please read them over, and then we'll, we'll move on after a minute or so. Okay, next slide, please. Standards 12 through 15 track Title VI requirements for outreach, notice, and grievance and complaint procedures. Again, these standards weren't just made up. The standards derive from specific federal legal requirements for all of you who receive federal funding. If you don't show me a hospital, for example, that doesn't comply with class, Show me a hospital that doesn't implement the standards we're talking about, and I'll show you a hospital that has a higher than acceptable readmission rate and is at greater risk for a medical malpractice judgment. That means liability and a federal investigation. So these are real requirements with real teeth behind them. The law, federal law, a 49-year-old federal civil rights statute. Next slide, please. So one of the, the, the big kickers with Title VI, and as I like to describe it, as my son describes it, is the big hammer. Under Title VI, plaintiffs can sue you in court, in federal or state court, and recover money, plus attorney's fees. Lawyers love recovering attorney's fees from the losing party in a lawsuit. I don't know what it is, but when you recover attorney's fees in a lawsuit, that just gives you an added measure of comfort. We'll put it that way. In a Title VI case, in order to win, you must prove something called intentional discrimination. Now, intentional discrimination can be pretty obvious. If I tell people, uh, you can't, you don't speak English, you can't come in here or you're of a different color, you can't come in here. Now, for the most part, those, those seem, the, and they are, to be very basic, very threshold issues of discrimination. But intentional discrimination can be proven in many other ways. You don't comply with class, that's going to help me show you're, not, you're intentionally discriminating against people. You don't provide language assistance. Your language assistance is inadequate. Let's say, for example, you use you have physicians who use relatives to be the interpreter, or they use children as the interpreter. And I use the word interpreter in quotes in this context because there's no way that a child can be a qualified interpreter or that my neighbor can be a qualified interpreter uh, compared to someone who's been tested, vetted, and been shown to have the language skills and ability to be able to provide effective language assistance and give the meaningful access that federal law requires. Hostile comments from staff, that's kind of like what I was saying before. Go back to your home country, why don't you speak English, for example. These things play out all the time. I heard them when I was with Justice, I hear them now. Uh, it's remarkable to me when I do physician training, for example, how many physicians I have very interesting conversations with, not only about these requirements, but about uh, opinions concerning federal law, federal mandates, and the language assistance 
requirements that are at the core of Title VI. No LAP plan, that's a language assistance plan. No staff training, some or all of the above. So I could pick two or three of these. Let's say, for example, you don't do them or you do them poorly, particularly if you don't comply with class, you don't do training, for example, and you use friends or relatives to provide language assistance. That's going to help me make a good case. And that means I can tell my wife that, wow, looks like we're going to get a nice, hefty award of attorney's fees here. Next slide, please. Looking at class, tracking the law, please read this uh, paragraph. This is courtesy of, as it says at the bottom, the National Standards for Class and Health and Health in Health and Healthcare, a blueprint for advancing and sustaining class policy and practice. Now let's look what this says in the middle of the paragraph. Providers may be presumed negligent if an individual is unable to follow guidelines because they conflict with his or her beliefs and the provider neglected to identify and try to accommodate the beliefs. This is one example of how the law, and negligence is typically a state law issue, underlies all, all that we're talking about in ways that we're not necessarily going to be focusing on today, but it gives you, again, a good feel for this is, this is all about the law. It's all about the law. Additionally, if a provider proceeds with treatment or an intervention based on miscommunication due to poor quality, language assistance, he or she and his or her organization may face increased civil liability exposure. So uh, it, essentially, you do a bad job with language assistance, you don't take class seriously, you don't train your staff on the issues that we're talking about, then that cause fits very well. I see that, I have seen that play out time and time and time again. Always to the detriment of the organization and to the organization's bottom line and, and to the pockets, the wallets of the organization as well as uh, healthcare provider professionals. Next slide, please. Class standard number five, offer language assistance to individuals who have limited English proficiency and or other communication needs. And or other communication needs can refer to people who are deaf or hard of hearing. People with disabilities are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and the Affordable Care Act, all of which prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities. So with someone who is deaf or hard of hearing, for example, there will be a requirement that your organization make communications accessible to them. That could mean through a sign language interpreter, for example, or other methods of providing language assistance. So although we're not going to be focusing on the disability aspects of class today, please be advised that these standards are, are much broader even than where we're going now with language assistance and, and health disparities for people who are who are minor racial minorities, for example. Disability plays a significant role in this as well. The ADA and the Rehabilitation Act have their own requirements. That's maybe the stuff for, a, for another webinar, uh, but class is very broad. It's much more than language and much more than race. Next slide, please. So what happens if you violate Title VI? You can lose your federal funds. Compliance reviews. Compliance reviews can be like audits on tax audits on steroids. Ongoing federal investigations and oversight. And then my favorite one. Remember, under Title VI, you can be sued for money. Civil rights money damages are not covered by malpractice insurance. You pay out of pocket. So if you're found liable by a court for violating a federal civil rights statute and damages are assessed because of that finding, you pay for it. You go to your partner and tell him or her, oh, i got to take $500,000 out of the bank to pay for this. Going back briefly to the compliance review part, part of this slide, when you receive federal funding, you sign something called a certificate of assurance that says essentially you are complying, you, you are complying with federal law. Sometimes that can be done under penalty of perjury. But I always enjoyed when I was with justice when someone told me, I never heard of Title VI. 
pulling out the certificate of assurance they signed or their boss signed, saying, this is your signature, and it says federal law. So that's really what we're talking about today. So this is, there's really no, you know, the old phrase, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, that certainly applies here. You receive the federal funding, you sign the certificate of assurance, as long as you have that federal funding, you are covered. You are required to comply, and that means also complying in, uh, with the federal government and cooperating in an investigation or request for information. And the request can be huge, depending upon the situation that you're in. Post-2012 election enforcement, after the election, the presidential election last year, a lot of um, enforcement initiatives that had been pending, the results of the election move forward. One of them is, for example, HHS's compliance review initiative earlier this year of critical access hospitals. There have been many other initiatives that have been uh, released, uh, brought forward, or, or are moving forward now. So typically after a presidential election, the floodgates open in a sense, and initiatives that had been awaiting the results of the election then move forward, and that's what's happening now. Next slide, please. These are some examples of some recent, uh, over the last couple of years, federal enforcement activity. Um, and don't be surprised if you haven't heard of most, if not all of them, because a lot of activity is not publicized. The $60, 60 million dollar cut off of federal funding to a large West Coast agency, uh, that was as a result of a Title VI complaint based on racial discrimination. The federal agency, in this case, gave the organization several opportunities to correct the discrimination problems. The organization was unable to do so to the satisfaction of the federal government, so they lost their money. Maybe some of you got some of the money, because although the organization did uh, fix the problem after they lost their $60 million, they didn't get all the money back. They got some of it, but not all of it. Uh, federal funding was suspended to a large East Coast organization within the last couple of years uh, under the Obama administration as a result also of a Title VI complaint based on race. Healthcare provider investigations, we were talking about that earlier as far as compliance reviews. CMS readmission penalties are big, huge, and happening every day. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. The last one, in many ways, is one of my favorites. Uh, HHS in July announced the termination of Medicaid funding to a California surgeon who discriminated against an HIV-positive patient by reform, refusing to perform surgery. Being HIV-positive is a recognized disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act. Refusing to provide services to someone who is HIV-positive is a violation of federal law. Now, in this case, this physician's practice, uh, in this physician's practice, Medicaid funding was a significant part of the, the uh, operating income, if you will. I don't think they're getting Medicaid funding back anytime soon because that is a, that's a very significant step to take. So for anybody who ever asks or wonders, well, they never take funding away. So there's a perfect example of something that happened just this year. Next slide, please. This slide is, I think, very relevant and important to healthcare providers. This is uh, from a, a recent federal enforcement agreement with a large hospital. And the agreement, it required what's in quotations, required a significant training program for the hospital to implement. And one of the trainings, interestingly, that the hospital was required to have was, as, as the quote says in red, the impact of ethnic and cultural differences on effective communication and the need for sensitivity to diversify issues, to diversity issues, excuse me. That's class. That was one of 17 required training topics. So think about what training you do. Do you have class training? And how effective is it? Because if you don't have it, that, that is, again, is likely going to be a great window into your overall compliance, your overall risk management posture, and where you are as far as the likelihood of liability in a private lawsuit. So this, this also is another, another connection between class and the law. 
again, the class standards aren't just, they're not, just not pretty and, and things that were pulled out of thin air. They have very definite legal connections and consequences. And here, as I said, is a perfect example of where the feds are going. They're looking at hospitals, they're looking at hospitals to do class training and requiring them to do so. Next slide, please. Could this happen to you? I ask that, of course, rhetorically. There's a true story. This is the uh, medical malpractice case I was involved in a few years ago. I was hired by a large hospital as a, an expert witness. In this particular case, there were uh, an, uh, two LEP parents, uh, Spanish-speaking, of an infant patient. I believe at the time she was about a year old. The adult sibling of one parent used was used to interpret and inf inform consent and other communications for the parents. There was a tragic outcome to the surgery. The parents filed a medical malpractice case under state law and also pr and also sued under Title VI saying that using the adult sibling to provide language assistance was a violation of federal law and was national origin discrimination. In this case, the surgeon settled out of court for a large seven-figure sum, I don't know how much. The hospital settled one month short of trial for a publicly released amount of $1 million. There is no informed consent without a qualified interpreter. As someone who's been a lawyer for several decades and who has litigated cases in federal and state court, I can't prove informed consent if you don't use a qualified interpreter. If you use that friend, if you use that neighbor, if you use that child, there is no way that you have any reliable documentation to prove that the patient actually understood what the physician, the nurse, or other medical professional was saying regarding the procedure. And just think about that. If my wife, for example, is used to interpret for me, and she is not an interpreter, doesn't have a medical background, how could she possibly explain to me so that I can objectively consent to a procedure what I need to do to understand the risks? Can't happen. Cannot happen. Next slide, please. So think about this. Would class compliance in the case that, that I mentioned in the last slide have made a difference? With effective and authoritative training, Title VI and class compliant policies, would the adult sibling still be used to interpret? Rhetorically, you, you figure it out, you decide. The bottom line with this is you make the legally required changes, you make, you implement the legally required training and policies, or a jury is going to decide for you. This isn't something that may happen, it will happen. And just as I discovered recently in a brand new medical malpractice case with a similar situation of an LEP patient being provided, quote, language assistance, unquote, by the patient's daughter, that is a sure method for seeing uh, you pay out large sums of money. When if you had complied with class, if you had the training so that a physician in a situation like this would say, wait a minute, where's the interpreter? I need an interpreter. We're not moving forward without an interpreter. Make sure the consent form is in Spanish, for example. Until you're in that position, you're in the same risk as the hospital that got sued. You're in the same risk as that malpractice case I just learned about recently. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk, spend a few minutes talking about the readmission penalties on the Affordable Care Act. And uh, this slide relates to a New York Times article from November uh, 2002 talking about how many hospitals have been penalized for having too many readmissions, having readmissions above a certain rate. The Affordable Care Act provides for penalties for readmissions. The penalties are going up next year and the year after that. And as we talked about earlier, you don't get paid for people who come back to your hospital for problems that should have been taken care of the first time. In addition, there being, there being penalties that are being levied by HHS through CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medi Medicare and Medicaid Services. Next slide, please. 
legal case for culturally competent health care. Hopefully, we've, we've been able to provide you with a, a substantial ammunition to show the legal case so far. But now we're going to talk about the data, which is you cannot argue with, or at least not argue about convincingly. Next slide, please. Several of these slides relate to a great study from last year, Improving Patient Safety Systems for Patients with Limited English Proficiency, put out by the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, a part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Data clearly show that there is a longer length of hospital stays for LEP patients when professional interpreters are not used at admission or at discharge. Many of these things may seem logical. But oftentimes I hear about hospitals saying, well, we don't need language assistance. Why do we need interpreters? We're going to cut your budget. Well, to me, that's like cutting your electric bill, your gas bill, or not having antibiotics in your hospital. Because you reduce language services, you not provide interpreters, you don't translate documents, your readmissions are going up. Your liability is going up. And the likelihood of your being investigated and slammed by the feds goes up as well as you're being sued and having to pay out of pocket several million dollars. Next slide, please. Greater risk of surgical delays and readmission due to LEP patients' greater difficulty understanding instructions. Not surprising. Again, that difficulty will be remediated. That difficulty will be alleviated and lessened with compliant Title VI language assistance policies, procedures, and training. And also, here it is again, class implementation. Next slide, please. Again, readmissions rate or direct readmissions are directly can be directly tied to effective language assistance. As a lawyer, I don't typically, in fact, I'm ethically prohibited from guaranteeing certain results. In this situation, if you have class implementation, effective training, effective and compliant planning under Title VI in class, your readmissions are coming down. How much is going to depend on the situation. That's the business case. That's the cost issue here. Instead of cutting language assistance, make, make sure your, your policies, procedures, and trainings are compliant because you know what? Putting forward whatever the cost of that is is going to be less than the readmission penalty you're assigned, less than the cost of, of not getting paid for treating Medicare patients who return to the hospital for problems that should have been taken care of the first time. Next slide, please. Healthcare providers report, this is from a Kaiser Commission study from 12 years ago. Healthcare providers report that language difficulties and inadequate funding of language services are major barriers to LEP individuals' access to healthcare. Again, disparity, remember Title VI, remember national origin discrimination, but think about that, that paragraph about what the healthcare, provider, well, healthcare providers reported through the Kaiser study. And then we look at the next slide, please. OK, that Kaiser study, I ask you this. Is, is that evidence of discriminatory intent for providers who don't provide meaningful access to health care under Title VI and who don't implement class? Hmm, my, my legal mind says, wow, that sounds like an interesting bit of evidence that I could use. And certainly to me, that it can be evidence of discriminatory intent since this 12 year old, in this 12 year old study, healthcare providers acknowledged that, yep, you know, unless we have uh, language services and provide resources in language services, then limited English proficient people are not going to get full access to healthcare. Discriminatory intent, Title VI. All, it, all of this is connected and bound up to very significant and complex legal requirements. Next slide, please. This quotation is, a, is an example of the complexity of what we're talking about. 
circumstantial evidence alone may establish discriminatory intent. That's a quote from two federal court decisions, one of them a Supreme Court decision. I get asked all the time, well, what website can I go to to get an answer to this? How do I know if what we're doing is legal? I read the guidance from HHS and it doesn't seem like it says anything about this. Title VI is more than looking at guidances, looking at letters, and looking at advisories. There's a body of federal law that's very complex that goes back decades dealing with issues of discriminatory intent. The issue of the Kaiser study is just one example. So if, given the Kaiser study, I know that providing inadequate uh, language services is going to result in, in disparate outcomes based on language. Wasn't well, that circumstantial evidence that could be used to establish discriminatory intent? Think about that. Next slide, please. Again, from the AHRQ study, mul there are multiple liability consequences to non-compliant language assistance. And one of the, the biggest ones is poor or inadequate informed consent. And I would take that to the next level. I would say, as I said earlier, there is no informed consent. You don't provide compliant language assistance, you don't have informed consent. At least not an informed consent that will stand up in court. Next slide, please. This is a, a very interesting study from three years ago. Uh, the uh, University of California School of Public Health and the National Health Law Program looked at the malpractice cases of one mal malpractice insurance carrier, medical malpractice, looked at 35 cases. In 32 of them, healthcare providers did not use competent interpreters to provide language assistance. In 12 of the 32 cases, family members or friends were used as interpreters including minor children in two of them. So what happened? More than $5 million in damages and settlements. And again, going back, thinking about that slide we talked about earlier, asking yourselves rhetorically, would that have happened with class implementation, effective training, compliant training and procedures, effective language assistance? I would say no. I would say there would not have been $5 million in damages and settlements. Would there have been some level of damage? Sure. Some amount of recovery, but I'm pretty confident it would be less than $5 million. Next slide, please. Compliance. Compliance to me is all about training and implementation. You are required by federal law to provide mandatory training on the subjects that we're talking about today. That's mandatory training for all staff who interact with the public, everyone, plus leadership. That's nurses, physicians, employed physicians, non-employed physicians. You have an ongoing planning process. You have Title VI plans and language assistance plans, which are updated. They don't just gather dust on your shelves and are never used and never looked at. They're updated. Next slide, please. This will give you a sense, give you a, a, a sense, a, a self-assessment of where you stand as far as compliance with Title VI and CLASS. Looking at the, the four uh, questions in red, looking at training. Have you implemented CLASS? And when was the last time you talked to your malpractice insurance carrier? Because they would be happy to tell you that civil rights violations are not covered by your insurance. But looking more broadly, Again, do you use children, friends, or relatives to provide language assistance? Do you train and certify your interpreters? Do you restrict language access to certain areas, meaning do you only provide interpreters in the emergency room, but not in um, delivery, for example? Have you asked LEP people to come back another day when an interpreter is available? Well, we don't have an interpreter for you on Monday. Why don't you come back for surgery on Wednesday? Think about it. Think about it objectively. Think about how you do with just these very general areas as far as compliance. Next slide, please. No, no, no. If you learn, if you take nothing else away from you today, please do not use children, friends, or relatives to provide language assistance. You do it, and I guarantee you that you are likelier to get sued and likelier to be investigated and likelier to have higher readmissions than a hospital that doesn't do this. I, one of the hospital clients that I worked with a few years ago 
had, a, had an issue with third parties providing language assistance. The CEO sent a system-wide email saying, from now on, we're not going to do this. Any medical professional who does so will go through the internal disciplinary process. You know what? The rate of third-party language assistance use dropped dramatically within a year, so that now they don't have this as a problem anymore. I can't say that this never happens in this particular hospital, but at this point, because they have shown uh, substantial efforts to solve this problem, it would be more of a question, I would think, of non-intentional discrimination, potentially negligence. If a nurse, for example, used a relative as an interpreter, because of all the steps they've taken to address this issue, that really is going to go a long way to rebutting an allegation of intentional discrimination under federal law. Next slide, please. This picture is courtesy of my son. At this slide, in wrapping up as we move forward, effective Title VI compliant language assistance plus legally compliant language assistance policies plus class compliance plus culturally competent health care equals lower liability risk, more cost efficient services, lower hospital readmissions, lower risk of federal sanction, lower risk of losing federal money and it gives you new customers. All of these things are not speculative. All of these things are bottom lines. Next slide, please. Courtesy of my son, Michael Adelson, proper language assistance is the law. Bam! Class equals Title VI. Class isn't about just doing the right thing. It is directly connected to federal law. And one of the federal laws, which is the, a, one of the bedrock civil rights statutes in American history. Next slide, please. This is my contact information. As Cherie said, we're delighted to provide the presentation today to be posted on the Hopkins uh, YouTube website. For permission for, to dis distribute, use, or copy our presentation for use beyond uh, you today, the people who have registered, please contact us for permission because our presentation is copyrighted. Thank you very much for your present, for your cooperation today. I hope, I hope it was, my presentation was helpful. And now I'd like to take your questions. Great. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate that. So we've had a number of questions come in. So um, we're going to try to get through as many of these as we can. So um, the first question we have for you, Bruce, is, are there any specific tools that help you accomplish the work that you've just discussed? Meaning, not just the shoulds, but the mechanisms that can help you get it done. Sure, and I think that's a question that I hear all the time and is really going to be directly connected to training. And I think you ask yourselves, do you provide information like what you've heard today in your facility? Have you done that? What kind of training program do you have and is it mandatory? Training is at the core of everything. It's one of the first things that the feds look for in an investigation or in a compliance review. What kind of training do you have? In, with working with a hospital recently who was under investigation and put under a consent agreement by the feds, one of the first questions they asked was, tell us about your mandatory training. That's mandatory training beyond new employee 10-minute conversations. Training informs everything. So you look at the training you have, look at the plans and policies that you have, assuming that they're non-compliant, making them so, but also making them really vibrant so that they're more than just words on the page, you actually do them. As I would bet hospitals are likelier to have infection control protocols than effective mandatory training about the issues we discussed. And while infection protocols are certainly important, what we've talked about today is an equally required by law and is also vitally important. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. So uh, one question we have, this is from Nitsa Diaz. The question is, does bilingual staff include the custodian? Oh, that's a great question. Boy, I, I, have I seen that play out many times. I think as far as providing Title VI language assistance, 
the likelihood is no, that bilingual custodians are not to be considered part of the universe of people who are providing language assistance. However, if a custodian has been trained and assessed for language ability and part of his or her responsibility and or job description is to provide some basic level of language assistance, meaning how to please show me how I get to radiology, I could see that that could work. But a custodian cannot legally be pulled into a patient's a patient room to interpret for an LEP patient with a doctor. That's at best, at the least, that's inadvisable and raises significant compliance concerns. Remember we talked about intentional discrimination. If you're using custodians to provide language assistance, the likelihood is your language assistance is ineffective, you're not providing meaningful access, and you're on the, um, the, um, the, 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 the glide path to in intentional discrimination liability. Great, thank you, Bruce. And I see we have a couple of hands up. So um, I see there's a question from Barbara Bogomolov. Barbara, I'm going to unmute you. Barbara, can you hear us? Barbara? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, great, go ahead, thanks. Thank you, I appreciate it. Our question involves very rare languages. We have um, on an average of about 104 languages on our campus related to informed consent. When we have a situation where the language is incredibly rare and we are unable to obtain interpreters um, either by phone and we use several services or um, uh, even in the Midwest there isn't somebody available. In that situation with a willing family member and an interpreter present who does not have the language skills but is working with the healthcare providers to make sure that um, all effort is made to use speak back and other appropriate methods to communicate. Is this something that reaches a threshold of an accommodation? Well, that's a great question and not surprisingly the places all over the country are, are in and have been in similar situations. The solution is going to be informed in part by your planning process which should you should have a plan and procedure to deal with this by what's called the four-factor analysis, which is at the core of Title VI compliance, to let you see, let organizations see how to comply in given situations depending upon, for example, the uh, LEP populations that they serve. In your particular example, if you've exhausted all efforts to find an interpreter in a language that is objectively rare, and you have found no one. In that situation with documentation in the medical record as well as document, documenting all of the steps you've taken by also showing your great plan and procedures and how you use, use the four-factor analysis, sure I could see using a third party in that situation to, if all else has failed, to provide language assistance in the informed consent context. And you also suggest another important point. If you're going to provide language assistance in no place other than two areas, having that done in informed consent and a discharge are incredibly important. Because obviously informed consent informs the treatment in healthcare. Discharge instructions can inform your readmissions as well as the care that the patient receives subsequently. So, although language assistance, of course, is required, you know, across the board, in informed consent and with discharge, and it is absolutely critical. Uh, but going back to what you said, you sh organizations are required by Title VI to have an understanding of their community, to know what people come into the hospital on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, for example, speaking what languages. So in many situations, depending on the community, there can be some level of preparation for patients who speak uh, languages who are, that are uncommon. So that's, that's something that should be part of your uh, planning and four-factor analysis process. Great, thank you. And I wanted to do, to do a quick show of hands. I'm reading the comments coming through.
A few people are saying they're having difficulty hearing me. If that's the case, can you raise your hand so I can see if this is a problem for everyone or only a few? Oh, that's interesting. Bruce, are you able to hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I don't, I don't know what is going on there. Uh, so, Barbara, thank you for your question. Bruce, thank you for your response. I will mute you now, Barbara. And I see that Suzanne Begley had a question. And Suzanne, I'm going to try to unmute you. Suzanne, can you hear us? Suzanne? Okay. Great. Suzanne, oh, okay, thank you. She just uh, typed a question. One moment, please. Okay, great. Thank you, Suzanne. If you do have a question, please go ahead and type it in. So the next question, and this is actually, I'm going to combine two questions. The uh, questions, Bruce, are how can a state agency embed this widely? And this goes along with another question that has to do with state and local regulators. And the person just wanted to know or suggest how can class be implemented for state and local regulators? So I think that that's that's a great question, and it's it's, it's interesting that I, I recently was asked that by um, a, a, someone who is a, a a state healthcare employed by a state healthcare agency. You know, I I know that that's that saying you know it's all about the training is is redundant, but it really is. I think that that there are. Um, some resources that are out there, but what I find very frustrating is that the agencies, the federal agencies that we're talking about, like HHS, excuse me, is a regulatory agency. So they are interested in your compliance with federal regulations. But federal regulations don't cover malpractice liability, for example, or negligence under state law. So making the connection between class and Title VI and informed consent and negligence and malpractice are important. Now, interestingly, I did get a call recently from an, an HHS official who asked me, so Bruce, tell, tell me about that connection you make between language assistance and Title VI. I know there's a lot of concern in, in the federal government about engaging healthcare providers more on this issue of language assistance and explaining what we talked about today, how this is directly related to readmissions, malpractice liability, and informed consent. That's not something that gets talked about very much, but I think that's a very important part of the conversation because as we all know, money talks, whether that's money in a $10 million court judgment or $5 million walking out the door because CMS just took it away from you. Money talks and having the information like what we've talked about today is very important both for a state agency and for a, a community hospital. Making sure leadership understands that language assistance, as I said, is as vitally important as antibiotics in a sense are in a hospital. Great. Thank you, Bruce. So we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I have a question from a person who said that there is a pediatric clinic, and I'm not going to name the location, that says that Title VI is not a law. It is just a suggestion to providers. What do you say to this provider? This provider takes Medicaid and won't provide interpreters. They always say that it is the responsibility of the family member to come with an interpreter. Boy, I would say, tell me where they are so I can go sue them next week. Um, because that that is just so blatantly incorrect. Title VI isn't an advisory. It's not a suggestion. It's a law. And uh, I have to say that in my experience, people who don't understand and don't appreciate the full weight of what we're discussing simply just aren't aware of the connections that, that we've made today. When I can't tell you how many physician uh, education sessions I've done and dinners and lunches and trainings and breakfasts. 
where the physicians may not like hearing about additional federal mandates, but in 95%, if not 99%, have all appreciated the information because it informs their practice, it informs how they can uh, avoid getting sued and paying out of pocket, and then they can figure out how to best comply with the requirements. But Medicaid is a, a private a um, private physician's practice that takes Medicaid is covered by Title VI as much as a hospital that takes Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement is. So this sounds like a situation where this facility needs significant education and hopefully they'll get it before a federal marshal knocks on the door and serves them with a summons. Great, thank you, Bruce. Now, this next question directly relates to the four-factor analysis that you mentioned towards the okay. end of the presentation. It asks, does the number of LEP patients a small clinic or practice has determine whether or not they should provide interpreters? Yeah, and I think that's a great, a great point. The four-factor analysis will, in part, will say, for example, if I'm a small rural 10-bed clinic, and I see six people a year who are limited English proficient, and all the people I see speak Russian, then I'm probably not going to need a Spanish language interpreter on staff, and I'm probably not going to need a Russian language interpreter on staff. In that situation, a telephonic language service, presuming that the service is a good one, may be sufficient. But by using the four-factor analysis, I can figure that out. The four-factor analysis was developed by the Department of Justice um, about 10 years ago as a way to inform, at least at the threshold, how to comply with the language assistance requirements of Title VI. Uh, we did a webinar about the four-factor analysis earlier this summer just to introduce people to the, the concept of the four-factor analysis because, you know, again, going back to intentional discrimination, if you don't know what the four-factor analysis is, and, you, and you're not using it to inform the provision of language assistance, then you have a compliance problem. How big it is, how much it relates to intentional discrimination is something else. So in a situation where a small clinic just doesn't see a lot of people who are LEP, that clinic is going to have to do less than, let's say, a hospital in New York City that is seeing regularly every day people who speak many different languages and is, will be seeing many more people than the small rural clinic. So the four-factor analysis is the start of that and that will also is, is also connected to the data and the analysis of data that you're required to have as a federally subsidized healthcare provider. For example, do you know on a monthly, weekly, or daily basis, what patients you see who speak which speak other languages and what languages they speak. You're supposed to know that. You're required to know that. I find that the data and record keeping requirements are among the most difficult for compliance because 99% of organizations out there don't know about them. And I think that that relates to the four-factor analysis. Most of the organizations that I came into contact with the justice and even come into contact with today, I've never heard of the four-factor analysis. Right. Very good. Thank you. Our next question is, what about native English speakers that may not be able to read? Are they considered LEP individuals? Does the uh, recipient have an obligation to provide assistance? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that for a native a native English speaker who may be illiterate, for example, or may have uh, or, or who also may may not understand um, uh, information related to to her medical care, that person is likely not going to be covered by Title VI, at least from a national origin standpoint. Um, if the person has some type of cognitive dis difficulty, that may be a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which will have to be um, taken into account as far as the person's care. In, in situations where there is no disability and there is no uh, language assistance issue for a non-English language, then likely the liability situation will be informed with, by state law. 
uh, regarding negligence, for example, and standard of care. So Title VI what may not apply in, in that situation. Great. Thank you, Bruce. The next question, and I've seen a few questions about this that has to do with where does this legislation apply? One question asks whether the topics you raised today are applicable to health plans. And then another question asks whether this covers all agencies. And the example given is citizenship and immigration services. Uh, the rest of the question says that although citizenship and immigration services is funded primarily through fees, they do receive about 1% of their budget via congressional appropriations. And so how would this fit in too with the requirements to be able to read and write English in order to be granted citizenship? Oh boy, that's 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 a question that, that involves a, a lot of nuances and, and pathways. Uh, let me see how, if, how I can address that. Overall, of course, with Title VI, the obligation tracks to federal funding. So if an organization receives federal funding, that organization is covered by Title VI. As far as federal agencies, federal agencies by themselves have separate requirements somewhat from a, a hospital, for example, or a state agency. The Attorney General of the United States, I believe within the last year, put out a directive to federal agencies for them to develop their own language assistance plans and policies so that uh, I think uh, HHS, for example, put out its uh, language assistance plan earlier this year. From a citizenship test standpoint, there is a specific the federal laws regarding citizenship that are operative today do require some level of proficiency in English so that while, for example, a driver's license test by a Department of Motor Vehicles in a state that, where that agency receive federal, receives federal funding, a driver's license test of someone who's LEP, that in that situation there, will, there could very well be a language assistance requirement for American citizenship because there are other federal laws that define the requirements for citizenship, Title VI won't, will not be um, coming into play as far as uh, the providing language assistance to people who are seeking to become American citizens. Great. And then the first part of that was the other question I was trying to weave into that is, is this applicable to health plans as well? Well, if the health plan, if, let's say with the health, the, the exchanges that were established under the Affordable Care Act, and that I know that that's not specifically what the question goes to, the exchanges are covered by Title VI because they're federally funded. Health plans like a Blue Cross plan, for example, if the plan does not receive federal funding, then Title VI will not or may not apply. But you know what? What's also very important that, for at least from the provider standpoint, that I tell providers all the time, let's pretend that Title VI does not exist. Doesn't there is no Title VI? You, see, you have the same issue we had talked about earlier with informed consent. If I'm a doctor or a nurse and I'm obtaining informed consent, I don't care what federal law says. If I'm getting informed consent from someone who's LEP, I'm going to have an interpreter. Because otherwise, I can't prove that informed consent was obtained. That's going to relate specifically to my liability, my wallet, and my license, all of which I protect very zealously. So I think you have to look at this in, 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 you know, in many different ways. And as I have advised individual doctors with one doctor practices, if you have someone coming in, who's LEP, and you are obtaining informed consent, you at least provide, get language assistance by the telephone to make sure you have a record that you have provided objective language assistance and that that person objectively understood. Record keeping and redundancy are big aspects of compliance and go a long way to reducing risk and reducing liability dangers. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I, we're going to take a few more questions, but one is, and several people have asked, well, our staff members are bilingual, so can they interpret? 
Well, my question, I'll throw a question back at you. Have you assessed your bilingual staff members? You know, I hear all the time, in fact, I heard recently from a client that they have a bilingual staff member who who translated documents in another state while working for an agency in that state. And my question was, have you assessed her language ability? Language ability and proficiency are more than just being, or being able to order at a French restaurant, for example. You have to be fluent in the target language and also fluent or proficient in the specific terminology related to a hospital, for example, or a court. So in a hospital, you, you will need to be proficient in terminology involving blood work, diseases, cancer, blood pressure, all of those things. So just taking high school, uh, high school Spanish, college level German, or even if you're a native speaker, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have all the language ability necessary to provide federally mandated language assistance, that you're trained in various protocols, that you understand the medical terminology was at, which is at the core of what you're supposed to do. I had a native Spanish speaker once. This was a, at a, a physician dinner where I gave a presentation about these issues a couple of years ago. And she said, you know, I grew up in Spain. I was born in Spain and immigrated to the United States. I can't do this because I can't tell you that I have all the terminology, all the wherewithal to be able to provide information in Spanish to someone who is, who, who is LEP, whose language is primarily in Spanish. And she said something that, that, that I always, I wish I could bronze this. She said, you know, I'm just not taking the chance because the consequences are so great both to the patient, the patient's life and, and safety, and also to my career and to my hospital in this case, I'm just not taking the chance. So bilingual is bilingual, and I guess you, you can't show me or prove in court or to a federal regulator that someone is bilingual unless you have assessed them. And if you have not assessed them, then that person is not bilingual and not bilingual in the eye of the law. We'll put it that way. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I'm going to take two more questions here. Um, one second, please. Okay, here's one. Hot topic from several questions. This one is, if the patient refuses to use interpretive services that is offered and it is documented with their refusal signature, be sufficient to cover their basis? Well, I wish I could tell you that absolutely. And then in, in that situation, you are completely covered. You're guaranteed to win in court. And the federal government will just say thank you very much and go on to somebody else. But that... Doc, that signature is going to provoke some other questions. How did you obtain the signature? Did you ask, did you provide information to the person in the person's native language? That language assistance is a federal right, that they will receive it for free, um, and that, that your organization has trained and qualified people to provide assistance in that person's native language and that there, there may be information about their medical condition and medical care that they don't want their neighbor, friend, relative, or child to know about. I find that in most cases where someone waives language assistance initially, they change their mind subsequently as the conversation with the doctor gets more and more personal and they are concerned about their f friend, relative, neighbor, or child hearing about very sensitive medical information. So even if you go to the, to, to the next level where the person, all that has been done, they've been given information in their native language, uh, they've been told about Title VI, they've been told it's a federal right and that it's free, and that they still waive their right. In that situation, the, my rhetorical question is, if you're relying on their neighbor to provide language assistance, how do you know if they make a mistake? What if the doctor says you have to take this pill once a day for the next two weeks? And instead of saying that, the neighbor says you have to take this pill once in two weeks. Who's liable? Not the neighbor. You're liable. 
so that while I recognize you, you certainly can't force people to have language assistance, I would ask you in a situation where someone has validly waived the right to assistance, do you have your own qualified interpreter there to monitor what this third party is saying and intervene with the doctor or nurse or other provider if they say something like I just suggested, oh, take one pill every two weeks? That again, that's part of the, the Title VI planning process and must be a, a very ele elemental part of your overall compliance conversations. Uh, that I see that play out an awful lot. Great. Um, I'm going to take one last question, recognizing that we unfortunately will not make it through all the questions. But this question is, I totally agree with these points. However, expenses to provide these very important services can be prohibitive, such as professional interpreters are costly. There is not a funding stream to support these costs. How should hospitals proceed? Well, I understand that that's, that's, that can be difficult. I also know that there are many cost-effective ways of providing language assistance, but then I go back to what I had said earlier. If your language assistance programs cost a million dollars, let's say, and you cut back, the cost to you in, in your penalties that will be imposed by the federal government or the cost to you of medical malpractice judgment far exceeds whatever you're paying now in language assistance. Um, there are many creative ways that people use to minimize the cost to the best extent possible of language assistance. But what's also true, frankly, there are a lot of language assistance providers out there. A lot of them aren't very good. And a lot of them charge rates that when I hear about them, I'm, I hear about them, I'm astounded that the rates are so high, but even more that hospitals pay them. So I think that, you know, I'm sure you vet various providers who provide various other services to your hospital. The same is true here. There are, there are many providers, but in my experience, the number of really good providers who will work with you as full compliance partners and perhaps even work with you as far as cost are not as numerous. But again, this is part of the larger conversation. And if leadership understands the costs of what we're talking about today, if I'm the CEO of an organization, I'm going to say, you know what? We can't really scrimp on this. This isn't something that we're going to be cutting back. And we're, going, we're not going to fire 30 staff interpreters or cut back on our language services contract. Costs are, are a big deal today, but as the Justice Department said to a state last year that was complaining about the costs of language assistance, Justice said, we give you millions of dollars in federal financial assistance. We have determined that the cost of your providing assistance is only a small percentage of the total federal assistance you receive. So essentially, essentially Justice said, don't complain that this costs you a certain amount because we know how much it should cost you. We also know how much money you receive. So that's a non-starter with us. I thought that was very revealing and that informs the larger point that you receive federal funding, you have to figure out ways to provide federally required language assistance. There are ways to do this. There are places all over the country that are in relatively good shape as far as compliance is concerned. Some are small, some are big. Most of them are in relatively good compliance health because they understand what we've been discussing today. Great. Thank you very much, Bruce. I'd thank like you. To, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. As I mentioned at the beginning, the webinar was recorded and the presentation slides will be available within 24 hours of today's webinar. Also, please watch your inboxes as you will be receiving an evaluation to complete regarding the webinar. And uh, I realize we didn't get through all the questions, but I did answer a few of them individually. And I may be able to get back to some of you regarding some of the other questions that you did ask. I was trying to kind of clump like questions together. So again, thank you for participating. Watch your inboxes and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.